your man, Louis T. Welcome to the 2021 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series where your man, Louis T. aims to break down all 32 teams in the National Football League's 2021 NFL Draft using our new grading scale. From 5 to 1, each pick will be assessed a score. We will tally up all the scores from that team's draft, divide by the number of picks, which will yield us an overall grade for that team's draft. We'll then move on to the next team in the series picked by you. That's right. You, the viewer out there, are in total control as this is the you pick format. Simply be the first to leave a comment in the comment section of this and and future videos in this series stating two things the phrase next and the team you'd like to see next some examples would be dolphins next next fins miami next you get where i'm going with this as a matter of fact the next team up in the series is none other than the miami dolphins and what they've done over the last two years has been nothing short of remarkable gm chris greer and head coach brian flores have come in and overhauled this entire organization and how it is perceived the dolphins once a laughing stock of this league now chock full of talent they won 10 games last year barely missed out on the postseason they have a quarterback that they believe in we don't know what he is fully capable of we'll see the deck has been cleared for him. There's no quarterback looking over his shoulder. We'll see what Tua Tungavailoa can do in his second season in the league. However, this is a Dolphins team that is ready to win now. They proved that a season ago. They have all this draft capital that they've been continuing to just spin around and around. They took, took the Laramie Tunzel deal and spawned more picks out of that, then flipped it again and got even more draft capital out of it. Uh, they continue to wheel and deal the draft better than any team in terms of acquiring draft capital. That said, all of that doesn't matter if you don't spend the picks wisely. And that's why this draft is important because I think the Dolphins did exactly that, spending these picks that they've acquired in various different deals over the years very wisely this year and continue to make those picks, produce more picks for them in the future as well so we'll take a look at their 2021 nfl draft they selected seven players you see all of them in front of you we'll pick them off one by one talk about what they bring to the table and why they're a great fit or not a great fit for the miami dolphins with that said let's jump into the miami dolphins draft where we start in the first round sixth overall selection wide receiver out of alabama jalen waddle is the pick this is a no-brainer and uh, there were questions as to what the Dolphins were coming back up to six for. Remember, the Dolphins originally had the third pick in the draft. They traded back. They allowed the 49ers to come up from 12. Then they went from 12 up to six with the Eagles. And there was a reason they wanted back into the top seven of the draft. This is why. Right here, Jalen Waddle giving them a true number one wide receiver. Now, I've always been a proponent of Devontae Parker. When he's healthy, I think he's got number one capabilities, low-end you know, number one capabilities in this league, but nonetheless, number one capabilities. Um, and I think adding a Jalen Waddle gives them another weapon out there that could be a number one wide receiver. I think the Dolphins are absolutely loaded at wide receiver with the addition of Jalen Waddle. When you look at what they've surrounded Tua Tungavailoa with outside of running back, which they, they did a little something with Malcolm Brown. But outside of running back, I think they're absolutely loaded on the offensive side of the football. There's no excuse for Tua uh, this season. If he can't get it done with the weapons he has now with Devontae Parker and um, Jalen Waddle and Preston Williams, and of course they went out and got uh, William Fuller uh, the fifth. With all these weapons, I think they have um, – the uh, Wilson, Albert Wilson coming back from COVID uh, when he sat out last year. They're just absolutely loaded at receiver. They've got a plethora of tight ends. You know, I, I love what they have at the tight end position. They added another tight end, which I thought was overkill. So they've got weapons galore. And Waddle is, to me, really simply put, he is a luxury pick that the Dolphins had at six. They wanted this guy. They targeted him. They went up. They got him. And uh, he's going to add more of what they already have. Jakeem Grant is a guy that I did not even name. That's just how deep they are at receiver. He's going to add something that they already have a lot of with Fuller and Jakeem Grant. And that's speed. 
And you can't teach it either. You have it or you don't. The, the Dolphins have it in spades. And Waddle is a guy that is the closest thing we've seen to Tyreek Hill, I think, coming out of college. That said, I've already broken down Jalen Waddle. I'm not going to do it here. And so if you're looking for a thorough breakdown of Jalen Waddle, what he brings to the table and um, what he can do for this Dolphins offense, then watch the Draft Prospects 101 series breakdown that I did of him. I'm going to leave that link in the comment section of the video. I'm going to pin that comment at the top with the other breakdowns that I've already had a chance to do, including uh, two other players in this draft. So I'll have all of those um, links pinned in the comment section so you can go to those videos if you so choose. But uh, in any event, this is a no-brainer. It's a home run. It's a slam dunk. It's whatever you want to call it when you feel really good about what you just did in the draft. For me, Jalen Waddle, a wide receiver out of Alabama, first pick um, or first round, sixth overall pick for me is without a doubt a five for the Miami Dolphins to get their draft kicked off, reuniting him with Tua Tunga Vailoa. You get to the second first round pick that the Dolphins had, 18th overall, edge rusher out of Miami, the U. Jalen Phillips is the pick. Back to back Jalen's for the Dolphins in the first round. And this was my number one edge rusher in this entire draft class. This was not a deep uh, draft class or uh, overly talented, you know, top heavy draft for edge rushers. I, I shouldn't say not deep. I think it might have been a little bit deeper, uh, but it wasn't top heavy. There, there was no consensus top 10 uh, pick at the position like there normally is, like a Boza or a Young or somebody like that. So um, to me, he was the best of the group, however. And if not for some of the off the field concerns and not like he's a bad guy, but there was a question of whether this kid loved football or not. He stepped away from the game for a while. He had some issues with concussions and things of that nature. There were question marks about Jalen Phillips, and that was the only thing that really gave me pause. But when you look at the way this kid moves and his size and his athleticism and what he brings to the table, he has a chance to be a dominant edge rusher. I've already broken Jalen Phillips down, so I'm not going to do that here. Just know that I think you got the best pure pass rusher in the draft. What does that mean? I can't tell you. There were years where the best or, to me, the more most pure pass rusher in the draft turned out to be average at the NFL level. So um, I don't really know what that means, but I can tell you this much. He's talented. He's got all the tools necessary to be a dominant edge rusher at the next level and the Dolphins to me honestly are a pass rusher away from being an elite unit defensively so if he can come in and give you a true havoc wreaking pass rusher off the edge this could be exactly what the doctor or uh, doctor ordered and the missing piece to what is a very talented defensive unit for the Miami Dolphins and well coached by head coach Brian Flores that said in the first round, 18th overall pick, edge rusher out of Miami, Jalen Phillips for me is a five. I've got questions, but the, the talent is undeniable. I think where you got him is perfect uh, for the value you're looking for in your draft. And to pop the top on the edge rushing position, which was a clear need for the Dolphins, and get the best one, in my opinion, in the draft, I think all of those things, a confluence of them coming together at 18, gives this uh, pick a five. You get to the next selection for the Miami Dolphins, second round, 36th overall. The defensive back out of Oregon, Javon Holland, is the pick. Uh, this is a guy that is very multifaceted, brings a lot to the table, 6'1", 207 pounds. So what you see in front of you in terms of height and weight for some of these players will be off just a bit. Uh, a lot. Remember, no combine this year. So essentially, I did a lot of these um, uh, player cards without the aid of you know them weighing in in a central location like the combine so you're going off of whatever the school tells you you're going off of you know random pro, pro days and stats and so you don't get the official weight for this year in particular until the pro days which i did a lot of these player cards way before the pro day so um, he's not 61196 but rather 61207 that said um, he looks the part of an NFL football player. We'll talk more about that here in a second. But uh, this is a guy did not play in 2020. 
uh, sat out due to COVID and decided to get ready for the NFL draft. So really not a lot of experience, only two years of ball at Oregon. And one of those seasons, he wasn't the primary starter. So you're not talking about a ton of starting experience yet. You're talking about a ton of ball production for Javon Holland. Um, and so we'll go through his numbers quickly. Uh, 27 games for Javon Holland in his career at Oregon, 110 tackles, four and a half of which were for loss. He also had nine interceptions, one going to the crib and 10 pass breakups. And that's the number that really stands out as the interception number, the, the amount of balls he got his hands on and picked off and made quarterbacks pay for throwing in his direction. That is an asinine amount of interceptions and ball production for the small amount of games played. You're talking about every three games this guy is averaging an interception in. That, that's insane. 27 games, nine interceptions. That's a small sample size in terms of games, yet that's a huge amount of ball production. So that's the thing that jumps out with, along with his versatility and his movement skills. But let's get to his strengths real quick. Uh, passes the eye test is the first strength. When you look at him, he looks the part of an NFL safety, NFL defensive back. I mean, this guy can line up everywhere. We'll talk about that in a second. But the fact that he just looks the part of an NFL defensive back is the first thing that you just look at and see with Javon Holland. Checks all of the height, weight, speed boxes. I mean, this is a guy that's 6'1", so that's the height you're looking for at, this, at the safety slash cornerback position. Um, he ran a 4'4", 6'40", so he checks off the speed box. And he's got the weight you're looking for, a north of 200 pounds, well, closer to 210. So everything you're looking for, this guy kind of checks off all the boxes there. Uh, fluid athleticism with great movement skills, which is why you feel really comfortable putting this guy in the slot, which is what he played a ton of at Oregon. And they moved this guy all around the football field. He was a deep safety. He was a half field safety. Um, he was a guy that they played a ton over the slot. He played near the line of scrimmage. He did a lot of different things for this Oregon defense. But uh, to me, the thing he excelled at was playing in the slot as a nickel defender or what a lot of teams call in the NFL a big nickel. Tremendous movement skills uh, to be able to do that. And at his size as, as well, playing against some smaller, shiftier receivers and things of that nature, he didn't seem out of place in any situation. High IQ football player. I, I thought just watching him on tape, you get a sense of a guy that understands you know, route concepts, what the offense is trying to do. He sees picks coming. And, and I thought his navigation of traffic was some of the best I've seen uh, in this draft and maybe even in the last two drafts or so where you just get a guy that understands, okay, they're trying to run a, a rub route here or a natural pick. Let me take a, a path of, of least resistance here. Let's not run into my own guy or run into their other receiver. I'm going to go around. I'm going to go under. He seems to always make the right decisions there. Okay, they're trying to run a wheel route up the sideline and they're trying to run a slant underneath to try to pick me. All right, I'm going to run over this. You know, to meet him at the apex of this route to make the quarterback turn it down and go somewhere else. Oh, they're trying to throw a wide receiver screen. I'm going to get inside of this block and go make a play in the backfield. Oh, you know, they're trying to run, you know, a little um, underneath uh, rub route, trying to run that mesh concept. Okay, I'm going to go over the top of this, play this thing on the other side. So he just does a phenomenal job of navigating his way through traffic. Um, willing and capable tackler. I'm out. When I watch him, you see a guy that just is willing and capable of getting in the mix, getting his uh, hands dirty and, and making some things happen. And um, that's something you want to see from a guy, especially if you're going to play in the slot. If you're going to play the big nickel position, you got to be willing and able to tackle. Javon Holland is able and willing to do that. Outstanding ball skills. I've already talked about the ball production, so I don't really need to hammer this home any more than I already have. But the fact that this guy has nine INTs in just 27 games and only 16 of those 27 games were starts. As I told you, not a, to a ton of starting um, experience, especially in that first year in 2018. He only started in two games in 2018, yet he still had five INTs, which is just insane. Now, starting a game doesn't always tell the story about how much playing time you're getting, but you know, if, if they truly believe in your talents, you're usually out there when the game starts. So the fact that Javon Holland was getting the kind of 
uh, ball production that he did despite not playing the amount of snaps that you would normally see from a guy of his um, talents, that says a lot. Um, positional flex. And he, the, part of the reason he has exceptional hands is because he was a high school wide receiver. So he, a lot of times with these guys that were high school wide receivers, you see it translate when they flip sides of the field. You see it with Javon Holland. You can see the natural hands ability to go and track and get the football. Positional flex, that's another thing that makes him an outstanding prospect in this draft and a guy that was going to come off the board no later than the second round is the fact that he is capable of doing so many different things on the field. And I've talked about this and alluded to it already. This guy can play in a slot. Uh, you can use him as a big nickel. Uh, he can play the safety position. Uh, you can move him around. I don't think he's necessarily a single high safety, but I think he is a half field split safety that can do some things in that regard. And again, the, the, the ability to play in the slot is uh, 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 some flexibility that teams love uh, with their safeties. Special teams value is the final strength. This is a guy that offers you punt return ability as well, and he can be dynamic in that uh, realm too. So uh, there's a lot of layers to Javon Holland, the football player, that I think intrigues the Dolphins, and, and that's why they pulled the trigger on him at 36 overall. Uh, weaknesses, he lacks instant acceleration and makeup speed. So one of the few drawbacks to him being in the slot, because I, I saw a guy that played um, off well, like he played in off coverage a ton, and he just seemed to know what the receiver was doing. It did a really good job of squatting on certain routes, planting and driving, coming downhill, making himself available at the point of catch. Um, but sometimes that can get you into trouble. You know, when you squat on a route and that's, uh, my next weakness, so I'll couple the two together. He guesses with flat-footed techniques sometimes. He squats a lot. He squats on routes. And, and again, if you do film study and you see it and you know that there's a tell here or, or this is what they like to run out of this formation, then you can squat on routes and you can do those things. And when you guess right, you look like a genius, and that's how you pick off nine passes. But if you guess wrong you and you don't have the makeup speed and he doesn't have that instant acceleration like he can't just turn and run and go from zero to 90 like that he's got to actually have a runway and I don't think he's capable of taking it to that fifth gear I don't even think he has a fifth gear I think he's got a fourth gear and that's really good that's how you get a four four six but in order to catch up to a guy that has four four one speed you got to have that fifth gear. You got to be able to shift it into high gear and turn it up. And when guys get on top of him, you don't see him recovering and getting back um, in phase with that receiver unless the ball is severely underthrown. So uh, there were a number of times where I saw guys just run right by him and he just didn't have the physical ability, makeup speed wise, to catch back up. And so guessing and, and being flat footed. Uh, at times can get him into trouble. It's also what makes him such a difficult defender to deal with is because he is often right when he's flat-footed and he's it's a shorter route and he understands that and he's able to break on it. But uh, that's something that he's going to have to clean up because these guys at the NFL level, very savvy, and they can run. And if he gets behind um, too far of some of these receivers, these quarterbacks aren't going to miss. At the end, these aren't Pac-12 quarterbacks. You're not playing Oregon State. You're not playing Washington, Washington State. These guys aren't going to miss. You give up that kind of space, you're behind a receiver two, three steps. You're cooked, and it's seven. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I, I want them to fight more aggressively to get off of blocks with better angles. There are times where felt like he could have done a little bit more to get off of a block, be more a part of the play in the run game. Uh, there are other times where I feel like in trying to avoid a block, he takes a poor angle and it takes him out of the play. And so I, I think those are some things that I feel like he needs to clean up. I'm nitpicking there, but at the end of the day, there are a lot more positives and things to like with Javon Holland than there are things not to like. And uh, there's no reason why I, I don't see this guy being a key contributor in his rookie campaign in Miami. My uh, player comp for Javon Holland is a guy that I absolutely loved. I loved him back in Green Bay and wanted my team to go after him in free agency, and that's Micah Hyde. 
just feel like Micah Hyde is a football player, a guy that you put anywhere on the field and he's going to make plays, can play over the slot, can play the safety position, uh, can play around the line of scrimmage, but does his best work in the secondary uh, with ball production. And I see, and Micah Hyde also had punt return ability in his career early on. I see a lot of the same similarities in Javon Holland. Um, in the second round, 36th overall pick, defensive back out of Oregon, Javon Holland for me is a four. This is a really good pickup by the Miami Dolphins, and it made a guy like Bobby McCain expendable this offseason, getting a guy in Holland that I think they're going to plug and play. You move on to the next selection by the Miami Dolphins, second round, 42nd pick overall. Um, offensive lineman out of Notre Dame, Liam Eichenberg is the pick. Uh, I'm a Notre Dame Fighting Irish fan, just to give you a little bit of perspective. So I saw a ton of Liam Eichenberg, know his game very well. This is a 6'6", 306-pound um, left tackle for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Made 38 consecutive starts for the Fighting Irish um, over his career um, in 43 games. So this guy was one of those players that played a ton of ball at Notre Dame. And I, I've always said this about Notre Dame, especially in recent years. On the offensive side, there, are, there aren't many items to go to Notre Dame for. You may get the occasional wide receiver, but we produce tight ends and offensive linemen on the offensive side of the football. And Liam Eichenberg is another one of those guys that can just flat out play ball. Now, with that said, he's not Quentin Nelson. You know, he's not Ronnie Stanley. He's not one of those types of guys. And um, he brings a lot to the table, however. But my question for him is, is his position at the next level truly tackle? Because he plays like a guy with short arms. It's, I've, that's always been one of my criticisms of him at Notre Dame is that he plays like a guy with short arms. And he does, in fact, have short arms we'll get to all of those things in this breakdown but let's talk about his strengths first nice lean evenly distributed frame I mean a distributed frame look at him in that uh, photo in front of you you see a guy that just has the type of frame that you covet at the NFL level um, there's not a lot of sloppiness not a lot of um, you know unnecessary weight everything is compact and well proportioned and that's how you want it in your tackle uh, plays at a steady pace on his terms. Like he, he's not a guy that you usually you see sped up, you know, because there's an edge rusher coming off the edge. You're not going to see him in a frenzy trying to get out of his day. He, he kind of plays at one speed, and that's what you want out of your offensive tackle. You don't want a guy that is allowing the defense to dictate what he does. And I think Liam Eichenberg is one of those guys that plays the game at his speed on his terms. Um, hands. Uh, twist and stunts off with ease. Uh, again, he's a guy that is very fundamentally sound, knows the game, uh, sees these things coming, does a great job of passing one off and picking up the next one. So uh, those aren't things I worry about with him. Um, strong hands that uh, feature a vice grip. So he's one of those guys that once he gets you in his clutches, it's a wrap. You know, lock him up, lock him up. Once he locks you up, once he's got a, a, a handful of cloth, forget about it. This guy isn't going to let go. So um, not not like a holding penalty, but once he gets up under your pads and he's able to you know, lock you up and he's got those, those vice grips on you, uh, it's going to be tough for you to make hay at that point. Excellent on the double teams and working to the second level. Um, he's probably a better run blocker than a pass blocker at this point. And you see that a lot of times with his ability to uh, work on that double team, come off of it, get to the second level, and get to another defender. Um, can move men as well as be a barrier in the run game. Um, when he plays with proper pad level and leverage and you get the knee bend, uh, this is a guy that can move a man against his will. And um, when he doesn't do that, at worst, he's going to at least create a barrier between the running back or the ball carrier and the defender. You know, at, he's going to do his job in the run game. I, I don't worry about Liam Eichenberg in that capacity. Experience and plays with what I like to call Notre Dame nasty. So 
for me as a Notre Dame Fighting Irish fan, our offensive line has always been the backbone of our football team. We just turn them out. Every year there's another guy or two that that's pro ready that's going to come in the league and have a successful, you know, 8 to 10 year career. And there's a little something extra with those guys, and I call it Notre Dame nasty, where you're just willing to put a guy's dick in the dirt. You know, a little extra sauce after the play, um, you know, a little a little physicality here and there where, where it may not be warranted, but that's just how we do. Um, he's got a little bit of that in him, not as much, obviously, as Quentin Nelson. No one has as much as Quentin Nelson, but he's got a little bit of that Notre Dame nasty, and, and that's what you want up front. I told you, you don't have to be – a savage and a flat out dog and on the offensive line but I do want to see some semblance of a nasty streak and Liam Eichenberg does have that and the fact that this guy's been a starter at left tackle for 38 consecutive starts tells you that he's durable which is the final strength and he's got some experience at the tackle position he's played against a number of NFL prospects while at left tackle so he's seen a lot of talent Um, Some situations he was really good, some not so good. Speaking of which, let's talk about his weaknesses. Does it feature an explosive kick slide or overwhelming athleticism to override the lack of quickness in his kick slide? So I've seen guys run by him, and I told you he plays at one speed. He plays at his terms, um, and he doesn't have the overwhelming athleticism to overcompensate for the lack of foot speed. He's not a tremendous athlete. He doesn't have elite quickness. He doesn't have great short area movement skills. He's solid in all of those regards. So um, a guy with explosive get off can really be problematic for him. And when you couple that with his shorter arms, this guy's got 32 and 3 8 inch arms. You're looking for at the tackle position, you start with a baseline of, okay, can you at least get me to 33 inches? Really, the, the cutoff point for most evaluators is 33 and a half inch arms. That's, that's the starting base point, okay? 33 and a half inch arms. Can you at least get me to 33? Maybe we can work with something there. He's 32 and 3 eighth inches of arm length, and that's just really unfortunate because he actually plays like a guy with short arms. Speaking of which, lacks timing and variety with his punch. He's a guy that you can time up. And when he gets beaten, when I saw him get beat at Notre Dame, a lot of times it's when a guy just synced up his punch. He saw him about to shoot his hands, slapped him down, and just went by him. Like It's not a lot of times where he's just getting assaulted off the edge with you know bull rush or pure speed. A lot of times he's in position to get the block or at least get a piece of the guy and slow him up. And, and the guy just times his punch up, slaps his hands down, and turns the corner on him. And so he's got to do a better job of, of varying when he's going to throw his punch, keep a guy off balance, keep him guessing as to when he's going to uncoil that punch. And, and, and so I think that's something he can work on. I don't think that's something that's innate or you can't get better at. Um, will lunge to try and establish first blow. I talked about that Notre Dame nasty. Sometimes he can take that a little too far. As a pass protector... If a guy isn't coming to meet you, you don't necessarily, unless it's a three-step drop and you need to get to him before he can get his hands up, there aren't many times where you need to be overly aggressive to go meet a guy. I'm not saying don't be, I talk about the trenches being like a boxing match. I'm not saying don't be aggressive and get off first because as that guy approaches you, as he crosses the line of scrimmage and he gets into your territory, into your domain, that's when you got to let him feel you. But if that guy is back there pussyfooting around and he hasn't gotten to a place where he becomes a threat, you don't need to go and meet him. And there are times when Liam Eichenberg takes it upon himself to go out and try to meet a guy instead of allowing that guy to come to him. And that's when he gets, you know, shoulders over toes. He ducks his head. And that's when he gets beat a lot of times. So, you know, that's something that he'll have to work on. And then last but not least, he's got short arms. I've already stated this. I don't need to beat it. It's a dead horse. But He's got short arms, and he's a guy that plays like someone with short arms. When he extends, guys with longer arms, they they tend to slap his hands down. Guys with longer arms tend to beat him to the punch and are able to initiate contact first. When he gets his arms slapped down, he can't recover because he doesn't have, you know, 34-inch arms to be able to get a piece of that guy and push him around the pocket. When he gets beat off the edge or his hands get slapped down, he's usually beaten on that play so 
He plays like a tackle with short arms, which leads me to believe that, you know, tackle may not necessarily be his position um, at the next level. But I've said this before. I'll say it again because this is one of my core principles and beliefs. Until you prove to me that you can't, I'm going to give you every opportunity to prove that you can. And so I think he's going to get a shot at tackle first. And he's going to have to prove to them that he can't do it before they decide to try and take other measures. In any event, um, Liam Eichenberg is a really solid football player. And I'm anxious to see what he does for the Miami Dolphins in the second round. 42nd pick overall. Offensive tackle out of Notre Dame. Liam Eichenberg for me is a three. As we move on to the next third round pick. Uh, by the Miami Dolphins, or excuse me, their first third round pick. And they had five picks in the first three rounds. This is the final of those five picks. Third uh, round, 81st overall, tight end out of Boston College. Hunter Long is the selection. I was surprised by this pick. I thought that they were loaded already at the tight end position. Love what they have as a number one option at tight end. Thought he really blossomed last year. And I thought they got some quality snaps out of their backup tight ends. And I didn't necessarily feel like this was a need. But if this is the best player on your board, you can never have enough talent, especially at the tight end position. And so they take Hunter Long, who was one of the better tight ends in a very weak tight end draft class. So um, to get this guy when you did, you got to feel really good. I had a third round grade on him. You take him in the third round. I think this is great value here. One of the better athletes at the tight end position in this draft as well. A high volume pass catcher. Nothing's flashy here, but really solid uh, to go along with what you already have um, at the tight end position. So I've already broken down Hunter Long. If you're looking for an extensive and thorough breakdown, I will pin that uh, link in the comment section. So I won't uh, waste any more time. Third round, 81st pick overall tight end out of Boston College. Hunter Long for me is... A three as we get to the final two picks of this Dolphins draft, both in the seventh round, the first of which 231st overall offensive lineman out of UMass, Larnell Coleman is the pick. 6'6", 307 pounds stands Larnell Coleman. And uh, this was a guy that had 29 career starts at UMass. Um, 13 of them at right tackle, 16 of the uh, rest of his starts at left tackle, and uh, this is a guy that started um, three straight years for UMass um, at the tackle position. In 2018, 12 starts at right tackle. 2019, 12 starts at left tackle, and only four games for uh, the UMass Minutemen in uh, college football with all the craziness going on in 2020. They only played four games. He started all four of them, and they got their asses whooped in every single one of them. That said... Um, the first thing I noticed before we get to his strengths, this guy is a tall, long drink of water. Pause. His arms extend for days and he is a very fluid athlete. Those are the first things that jumped out at me. And, and in the seventh round, that's what you do. I talk about this all the time. You take athletes, you take guys with red flags, you take guys with injury concerns, you take guys that played at a small school and and maybe didn't play the level of competition, you take guys that are making a positional switch, you take risk, you take guys that have upside. That's what the Dolphins did here with Larnell Coleman. This is a guy with high upside. They've got to work with him. Don't think he's going to make the team initially, but I think he is a guy that could potentially be a factor for this team you know a year or two down the road uh, let's talk about his strengths height weight speed specimen checks off all the boxes there at 66 307 uh, with uh, a 51040 but more importantly a 31 inch vert which tells you that there's explosiveness there quick short area quickness which he does have uh, does larnell coleman uh, length for days i've already stated that Guy's got 35 and a half inch arms. He's got an 85 inch wingspan, which tells you that this guy has ridiculously long arms. And and that's the first thing I noticed about him. Like, God, this guy's arms are humongous. So, um, I, and I, I, I fit, and I knew that without even knowing the measurements. You know, you could just see that. So. That's something else that I'm pretty sure intrigued the Dolphins and why they felt like they needed to take a flyer on this guy in the seventh round. 
uses his length to lock up rushers. Um, it isn't pretty, okay, by any stretch of the imagination what he does as a pass protector, but it is very effective. And he knows he's got long arms and he knows how to use them, and that's always a positive when a guy is able to acknowledge, yep, I got long arms and I know how to dispatch them. Uh, good enough feet coupled with athleticism to get out of the blocks. So um, when he gets out of his stance, it's not explosive by any stretch of the imagination, but he's such a good athlete that it's plenty good. His feet are fast enough. Uh, he plays stiff. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But one thing that he seems to have a really good grasp of is, hey, I got long arms. I, and I'm going to I'm going to make sure that they reach out and grab you before you can even get started. He he stops a lot of rushes before they get started with his length. And then it's just kind of a stalemate like you're standing there. He's standing there. He's got his arms on you. You're trying to move. You can't move. It's that kind of thing. So um, he does a really good job of of moving his feet well enough. And then that athleticism kicks in and really gives him an advantage there. To keep the pocket pocket integrity, even when a guy maybe beats him around the edge, that length just gives him a chance to ride that guy up the field and allow the quarterback to just kind of step up. Easy mover capable of getting out in front of plays and to the second level. Uh, they pulled him a ton. They, they I've watched some games where they actually moved this guy to guard and had him doing some work there. But this is a guy that could pull. And, and got outside in some outside zone situations and, and was able to get to some of those tough blocks on the outside. Uh, he's a guy that can get to that reach block on the backside of plays. He's a really good athlete. Get to the second level. Um, there, there's a lot here to work with. Again, a big slab of clay, a guy that, you know, if you're an offensive lineman coach, you get excited about these kinds of players. Weaknesses. Needs to bend the knees, uh, bend at the knees upon contact. Stiffed Stiff upright blocker. For me, uh, you see a lot of him um, approaching guys kind of standing straight up. He doesn't bend his knees enough upon contact. And it's crazy because when he gets out of his stance and he starts to run, whether it's outside zone or inside zone or something, he actually gets good bend and knee bend doing that. But once he makes contact, it, the knee bend, it, it start, he starts to bend at the hip. And instead of bending at his knees and you just see a guy that is upright a lot. And that's not that's never good for an offensive lineman when you can't get your pad level uh, low enough to really win in, in those situations. So I think he needs to um, he's stiff, though. I, I don't know if that's something he'll be able to change or not. He's a, he's a stiff blocker. But um, statuesque pass sets one, once contact is made. I talked about it not being pretty. Like, literally, it's stiff, it's upright, but he's so long, man, and he's so athletic that he gets away with some things that I'm like, I don't know, man. You get a better athlete at the next level with some skill because one of my final weaknesses is the fact that he played at UMass. So you're going up against Liberty, 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 Liberty. You're going up against Georgia Southern and Army and UConn and Marshall and all these rando teams you're not seeing a ton of nfl talent you get away with some of the deficiencies and some of the faults in his game you can get away with some of that stuff when you're playing against lesser competition you know he wasn't playing against power five schools he wasn't playing against the elite nfl talent week in week out that might have exposed some of his weaknesses so i'm anxious to see how he handles that transition from umass to playing at the NFL level. And then finally, his hand placement can be more consistent. Uh, I think his hands can get a little outside of the, the framework at times. And I think that's something that he needs to be a little bit more cognizant of is his hand placement and being able to sustain blocks. I think that's something that at times he struggles with in the run game, not necessarily in the pass game. So um, again, a lot to work with here. Don't think he's a guy that's ultimately going to make your football team, but these are the kind of guys you take in the seventh round, and I think the Dolphins feel like they got a guy they can work with and potentially have be a contributor down the road in the seventh round, 231st pick overall offensive lineman out of UMass. Larnell Coleman, for me, is a two. 
and we wrap up this Dolphins draft in the seventh round, 244th pick overall, running back out of Cincinnati. Jared Dokes is the pick, 5'11", 228 pounder in Jared Dokes, and that's a really solid, big, physical weight for a running back. And uh, he uh, looks the part. He runs the part at times. And um, I, I don't love the Dolphins' backfield. I've stated this many times before, but they've got so much stuff. And they're going to add Jared Dokes to that backfield. And I think he's got a legitimate shot. They don't have enough guys that, you know, scare you, that, that say, okay, well, we definitely got three backs. I don't know how he's going to make the football team. He's going to have a chance to come in there and compete, and we'll see what happens. They got a bunch of stuff, man. I None of it great, but all of it effective. You know, even the guys that played last year, a couple of those UW backs uh, were back there. Alvon, uh, um, Ahmed, uh, Salvan Ahmed, and um, forgot the other little small guy that's shifty, um, that, that did some good work for you when he was healthy. Uh, both of them from UW, they're, they're okay. I don't love them, you know. And so Jared Dokes, I think, is going to have a legitimate shot. So, um, numbers on Jared Dokes, 30 games in his collegiate career, 331 carries for 1,712 rush yards, which equals out to a 5.28 yards per carry average, 14 touchdowns in those 331 totes. Receiving wise, 36 catches, 407 yards and four scores in his career. Strengths. He has true NFL running back size at 5'11", 228. I mean, essentially you're talking 6 feet, 230. Looks like an NFL running back to me. Surprising quickness and burst for his size. I was really shocked at how quickly he got north and south. You know, if, if he sees a hole, he's able to exploit it, get north and south, get to the second level, and really put pressure on the defense. If you're out of position, he can run by you. He's not going to run away from you. But, you know, he gets on you a lot quicker. He's one of those guys you look at him, okay, bigger physical back, not expecting him to get up on me as quickly as he does. And then all of a sudden he's on you and then past you. And then you you turn on the burners and you go and hawk him down. But um, he's got a lot more quickness and burst than I was expecting watching him on tape. Can finish runs physically. You better be able to finish runs physically at at essentially six feet, 230. And he can. Has pass catching ability. I think that's underrated. I think he is a much better pass catcher than given credit for. Now, is he a route runner or a guy that is going to hurt you on a Texas route out of the backfield? Probably not. But out in the flats, as a guy that's an outlet, you know, checking down over the ball, I think he is is a guy that can help you there. And he may even he may even be able to give you a little something in terms of a route runner. I may be selling him short there, but I think he's got a lot better hands and can be a bigger part of the pass game than people are giving him credit for. Not afraid to step up in pass pro. Watched him stick his face mask in there a couple of times. Again, he's a bigger back. He's not one of these 202-pound scat backs that you're like, I don't know if he's going to be able to. He should be able to stand up, stick his nose in the chest of a blitzing linebacker, and, and be okay. And I saw him do that and do it with no problems. So I uh, feel good about him in that regard as well. Weaknesses. Lacks home run speed. Uh, caught from behind too many times on tape for me. But again, at six feet, essentially 230, I don't expect you to run away from guys. And he doesn't. Um, he ran a 4.58, uh, 40. So that tells you he's not a, a burner or a blazer by any stretch of the imagination. But that 39 and a half inch vertical tells you that there's an explosiveness quality to him which is what accounts for that quickness and burst that i talked about that he has initially when a hole presents itself but he lacks the ability to run away you watch him against houston he dominated the cougars in that game but he got hawked down from behind like twice in that game on what should have been touchdown runs if he would have had more speed to his game can can't create for himself so i watched him against tulsa before he got injured in that game and we'll talk about his injury uh, situation uh, here in a second. But I watched him in that Tulsa game, and Tulsa had one of the better defenses in the um, American Conference in 2020. And he had no space to operate, and he couldn't create any space for himself. He couldn't make the first man miss. He couldn't find a way 
to take a two yard run and make it a five yard run. He could he can only get what's there. If you block it for eight, he may be able to hit it with some quickness and may be able to get you 14 or 20. But you got to block it for eight first before he can get that done. He's not a guy you block it for two and he springs it for 22. He's not a creator. So you are going to have to open up some space for him in order for him to operate. Injury concerns. This is a guy that missed a game in every single year he played at uni- the University of Cincinnati except for 2019. In 2017, he missed three games due to injury. In 2018, he missed the entire season with a sports hernia injury that required surgery. In 2020, he got injured in the final game of their regular season in the AAC championship game versus Tulsa, which forced him to sit out the bowl game versus Georgia. That was a knee injury. So he's been a guy that has dealt with a myriad of injuries. That's something to keep in mind. It's on the Carfax. But um, there's a lot here to like with Jared Dokes. You know, I like him here in the seventh round. I don't love him, but I like him. And I think he's another quality back you add into that running back room if you're the Dolphins and and feel like he'll have a chance to compete to potentially make this football team my uh, pro comp for him is Jordan Howard a guy that you are all too familiar with he was in Miami just a season ago or two years ago maybe now Um, Jarrett Dokes looks a lot like him and it's no wonder they drafted him because this same staff really liked Jordan Howard, which is why they acquired him. So I think that Dokes is a guy that reminds me a lot of Jordan Howard and how he plays, much like Howard, not a creator, needs space. But once he gets that space, he's physical, uh, can make some things happen. And so um, I think this is a solid pick, seventh round, 244th overall. Running back out of Cincinnati, Jarrett Dokes, for me, is a two to round out the Dolphins draft. Let's take a look at the damage done by the Dolphins in their 2021 NFL draft. Uh, Seven picks in total. First two picks of the two Jalens. Waddle uh, at the receiver position, sixth overall, and Phillips um, as an edge rusher out of the U at 18, both fives to kick the draft off for the Dolphins in the first round. They had two picks in the second round. Javon Holland, defensive back out of Oregon, four. And Liam Eichenberg, uh, offensive lineman out of Notre Dame, a three. Hunter Long, tight end in the third round out of Boston College, is a three. And then they had two seventh rounders, offensive lineman Larnell Coleman out of UMass, he's a two. And uh, running back Jared Dokes out of Cincinnati in the seventh round, a two as well. You tally all of that up, you get 24 overall points. Divide by the number of pick seven, yield you a 3.43 final score for the Dolphins that is a magnificent draft if I may say so myself Chris Greer continues to knock it out of the park and I just love the direction that the Dolphins are going in right now and really the mat the big question in Miami is do they have the right guy at the quarterback position did they get it right they had a chance to take Justin Herbert no and look I didn't love Justin Herbert so I didn't think they got it wrong thought they got the right guy uh, but they had a chance to take Herbert they took to a did they get it right right now it looks like no they didn't get it right but so much time between now and when they'll have to make that final decision on Tua verdict still out jury still out we'll see what happens but if Tua is what we think he could be with all the talent on this football team the Miami Dolphins could be uh, major players in the AFC and this draft is going to add to that another solid draft haul by the Miami Dolphins. That's going to do it for me, your man Louis T, here on the Draft Wrap-Up Series. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the Louis T Network for more great content. Turn on your notification bell so you don't miss a thing. And also hit that like button if you enjoyed this content. There's plenty more where this came from. And so get off the bench, get in the game, and kick it with me, your man Louis T. Until next time, have a good one. Take care. See ya. Louis T.